welcome to lecture series on advanced geotechnical engineering being offered by the uh, department of engineering iit bombay professor bvs vishwanatham so we are in module 4 and lecture 6 on stress strain relationship and shear strength of uh, soils so in the previous uh, lecture we introduced about more column criterion and then introduced also the pq space and uh, in this lecture we will we'll, uh, try to discuss more about the more column failure criterion and uh, then interpretation and its correlation with the pq space and uh, further we will concentrate on definition of failure and interlocking concept and in its interpretations that is definition of failure particularly as far as the friction is concerned with interlocking concept and its interpretation. So, as we discussed in the previous lecture, we can actually express the principal stress relationships at failure as follows sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3 tan square alpha plus 2 c tan, 2 c tan alpha, where alpha is equal to 45 plus 5 by 2 and which is also called as the failure plane inclination. And in case if you are having a sigma 3 is equal to in another way as a sigma 3 as the major and sigma 1 as the minor, where sigma 3 is equal to sigma 1 tan square 45 minus 5 by 2 minus 2 c tan 45 uh, minus 5 by 2. Now, the more column idealization of geomaterials, if you look into it, we have uh, you know a sample, a cylindrical sample uh, subjected to a principal with stress sigma 1 dash and sigma 2 dash and sigma 3 dash. So, here as being sigma 2 dash is equal to sigma 3 dash in more column idealization what has been assumed is that sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 has been assumed or sigma 2 dash is equal to sigma 3 dash and this is the stress strain variation d matrix stress versus axial strain where axial strain in the direction of major principal major principal stress. So, this is the idealization and the slope of this is the elastic modulus and this is the uh, curve which we, uh, we may get experimentally and this is idealized uh, uh, in this fashion it is shown. So, uh, as we have uh, discussed the more diagram uh, and uh, uh, Coulomb uh, analog if you look into this Coulomb uh, as given uh, you know uh, in uh, during the investigations of retaining walls an equation which is actually called as tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi and more envelope actually has given as the tau is equal to function of uh, uh, sigma and this uh, nonlinear uh, uh, envelope uh, you know this nonlinear envelope is actually for more coulomb uh, more envelope and this one is for the coulomb uh, uh, coulomb equation so this actually has been idealized to a straight line and Coulomb in his investigations of retaining walls proposed a relationship tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi where c is the inherent shear strength also known as the coefficient c and phi is the angle of internal friction. So, the criterion contains two material constants yes c and phi and which are actually called as shear strength parameters and there are different methods to determine these shear strength parameters in the laboratory. They are primarily called you know the direct shear test and uh, triaxial test and the triaxial test actually has got uh, uh, you know the uh, three uh, different four, four different classes you can say and uh, the first uh, category is that uh, where we, we do a triaxial test with uh, no cell pressure, cell pressure. then uh, you know in that case it is actually called as unconfined uh, uh, you know compressive strength test it is called UCS test. And when we do this test with uh, you know a cell pressure that is uh, unconsolidated undrained uh, uh, triaxial test and when we do uh, you know the uh, triaxial test by allowing the consolidation uh, uh, you know during uh, by allowing the drainage during consolidation and uh, uh, and no drainage during uh, shear then it is called consolidated undrained uh, triaxial test. When we allow both uh, you know the drainage uh, during consolidation as well as the shear it is called consolidated drained uh, uh, triaxial compression test. 
So when we do this, uh, when we, as we have discussed it, that when we do a different cell pressures, we get the different sets of uh, uh, more circles. Uh, if you are if you are interpreting in terms of uh, total stresses, we'll get total stress envelopes. If you are actually interpreting in terms of effective stress, uh, uh, effective stress uh, parameters, then you'll get the effective stress envelopes. And with that, we'll be able to get the c dash and uh, phi dash. So here in this uh, particular. Uh, 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 diagram where the more uh, you know envelope is actually shown uh, along with uh, the coulomb uh, envelope and with the slope of inclination is uh, phi and the alpha f is that failure plane so the criterion basically uh, more basically consists of more coulomb criterion basically consists of two parameters that is c and uh, phi as opposed to one material constant for the tusca criterion as, as far as the tusca criterion is concerned and there is only one material constant. So yielding and failure takes place in the soil mass when mobilized actual stress stress at any plane tau m becomes equal to the shear strength tau f which is given by. So yielding and failure uh, takes place in the soil mass when mobilized actual shear stress uh, at any plane. Uh, tau m becomes equal to when tau m becomes equal to the uh, you know the shear strength tau f which is actually given by tau m is equal to c dash plus uh, sigma dash n tan phi dash is equal to tau f where c dash and phi dash are the strength parameters then we can write this as in terms of function of sigma dash as tau minus sigma n dash tan phi dash minus c dash is equal to 0. So this we have written in terms of uh, uh, in terms of function of sigma dash we have written like tau minus sigma n dash uh, uh, sigma dash n tan phi dash minus c dash is equal to 0. So uh, one uh, uh, point we need to note here uh, in, ca in case of the Mohr Coulomb uh, idealization we have discussed that uh, uh, because of the uh, you know the uh, non consideration of sigma 2 dash as can be seen here uh, when we have uh, when we have sigma 1 dash and then sigma 2 dash when with sigma 3 dash with the minor principle stress that this more circle is actually uh, uh, you know is uh, in contact with the failure envelope. So where sigma 1 dash is greater than sigma 2 dash greater than sigma 3 dash and uh, here note that the value of the intermediate principle stress does not actually influence the, the failure uh, failure. So, uh, this particular uh, you know the value of the sigma 2 dash uh, actually does not actually influence the, the failure. So in the case of more coulomb idealization uh, the intermediate uh, uh, you know uh, principal stress sigma 2 dash is neglected. So further uh, under the more coulomb idealization of geometrials and in this we consider uh, a tau versus uh, sigma and where, uh, uh, where, uh, uh, where you have got a more circle and uh, you have a sample which actually has got uh, you know if the sample is homogeneous we actually have got the conjugate failure planes in both the directions and you have got, you can have a failure plane in this direction and you can have a failure plane in this direction and with that uh, you know here this is the uh, failure plane and the parallel to this this is the failure plane inclination which is actually shown here and uh, so we can uh, write from the geometry of the uh, more circle by considering a more circle tangent uh, to the line that is a stress state associated uh, with the failure um, that is at this point uh, and using the trigonometric uh, relations, relations, relations the alternate form of tau is equal to c plus sigma f tan phi can be obtained. So in terms of principal stresses uh, it can be written as tau f is uh, can be uh, it can be seen as tau f is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 and sigma f is equal to uh, you know uh, which this point is nothing but sigma 3 plus uh, you know the sigma 1 minus sigma 3 uh, by 2. So if you look into this this will become sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2. So this point uh, is sigma 3 0 to it measures an ordinate of sigma 3 dash and uh, uh, this point actually measures uh, uh, you know this distance. Uh, so that is actually obtained as sigma 1 plus sigma 3 dash by 2. Uh, so we can actually write uh, this uh, you know in terms of principal stresses. Uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash by 2 is equal to uh, c dash cos phi dash plus uh, sigma 1 plus sigma 3 dash by 2 sin phi dash. So when we put this uh, in one side and we can actually write f is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 uh, minus uh, sigma 1 plus sigma 3 sin phi dash minus 2 c dash cos phi dash 
is equal to 0. So that is what actually it has been stated here uh, where f is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash minus sigma 1 dash plus sigma 1 3 sigma 3 dash sin phi dash minus 2 c dash cos phi dash is equal to 0. So this uh, you know uh, you know we, we actually deduced uh, from the trigonometric relation, relation by satisfying the trigonometric relation relations and from the geometry of the Mohr circle. And uh, this was actually earlier we have actually uh, when we have uh, done the uh, relation between the KF line and Mohr Coulomb failure envelope and this also can be expressed in terms of uh, you know principal stresses and when we plot uh, uh, PQ plot with uh, Q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash by 2 and P is equal to sigma 1 uh, plus sigma 3 dash by 2. Uh, when we plot uh, so when q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash by 2 and p is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 dash by 2 when you plot this is the uh, kf line and which is actually inclined at an angle psi so uh, when we compare uh, you know typical mohr circle and this thing when we we said that sin phi dash is equal to tan psi and c dash is equal to a by cos phi so by using this also we can get the you know the other form of tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi as sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash by 2 is equal to c cos phi plus sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 sin phi dash. So with this also we will able to get the expression which we are talking here sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash minus sigma 1 plus sigma 3 uh, sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash sin phi dash uh, minus 2 c dash cos phi dash is equal to 0. Now uh, with no order implied by the principal stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 the Mohr Coulomb criterion can be written as in the form of this uh, 6 equations and uh, this represent to 2 equations, this represent 2 equations, this represent uh, 2 equations wherein uh, this is nothing but plus or minus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 by 2 is equal to A into sigma 1 plus sigma 2 by 2 plus B plus or minus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 by 2 is equal to A into sigma 2 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus B and plus or minus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 by 2 is equal to A into sigma 3 plus sigma 1 by 2 plus B where A is equal to m minus uh, 1 by uh, m plus 1 that is A is equal to m minus 1 by m plus 1 and m is equal to C naught by T naught which is nothing but 1 plus sin phi dash by 1 minus sin phi dash and B is equal to 1 by 1 m plus 1 and C naught is equal to uh, m by m plus 1 where T naught is equal to C naught by 2 into 1 minus sin phi dash where A is actually within uh, 0 to 1 that is 0 less than or equal to uh, A is within uh, uh, you know 0 less than or equal to A less than 1. So uh, the values of uh, the C naught and T naught are actually depicted here the C naught and T naught are depicted here and uh, which is uh, shown here uh, the C naught. Uh, by T naught which is nothing but uh, the ratio of these two C naught by T naught, T naught and this is the uh, you know typical uh, uh, Mohr, uh, Mohr Coulomb failure envelope uh, with uh, you know a Mohr circle C and Mohr circle D. So uh, we have said that these uh, 6 equations are there and wherein uh, we actually have got A is equal to M minus 1 by M plus 1, M is equal to C naught by T naught and B is equal to 1 by M plus 1 where C naught is equal to m by m plus 1 and T naught is equal to C naught by 2 into 1 minus sin phi and where A is in between 0 to 1. So uh, this T naught is the theoretical uh, Mohr Coulomb uh, uniaxial tensile strength and that is on the negative side of the Mohr circle you can see that in tau sigma plot and uh, that is not observed in experiments rather a much lower strength uh, T is measured and uh, sigma 1 is equal to 0. Uh, and sigma t sigma 2 is equal to that is a sigma 1 is equal to 0 and uh, sigma 2 is equal to minus t that is uh, is actually shown here. So with the failure plane being normal uh, to uh, with the failure plane being normal to uh, normal to sigma 3 plane sigma 3 plane. So sigma 1 plane is here and the sigma 3 plane here so the failure plane uh, being normal to the sigma 3 plane. So the C naught is the theoretical uh, Mohr Coulomb uniaxial compressive strength. So C naught is the theoretical Mohr Coulomb uh, uniaxial compressive strength. C naught is the uh, you know theoretical Mohr Coulomb uniaxial compressive strength. Now the shape of the failure surface in principal stress space is dependent upon the form of failure criterion. 
So the shape of the failure surface in principal stress space is depend upon the uh, form of the failure criterion. Linear functions map as plans, planes and non-linear functions as curvilinear surfaces. So the shape of the failure surface in principal stress space is dependent on the form of failure criterion. Uh, uh, primarily it is linear functions map as planes and non-linear functions as curvilinear surfaces. So the following six equations, the equations which we have said uh, uh, you know which we just discussed uh, are represented by six planes that intersect one another along the six edges defining the hexagonal permit. So uh, the following six equations which are actually uh, discussed uh, just now are represented by the six planes that intersect one another along the six edges of the uh, defining a hexagonal pyramid. So that is uh, you know these uh, uh, six edges which are actually defining uh, this hexagonal pyramid uh, the, these equations actually represent these equations represent uh, you know the, the six planes that intersect one another along six edges defining the hexagonal pyramid. So uh, this is the you know failure surface that means that this is the failure surface and this is the hydrostatic axis this is the hydrostatic axis uh, say where sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 and this is the failure surface on equi pressure uh, on equi on the equi pressure uh, uh, plane sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 is equal to constant or pipe plane this is also called as the pipe plane perpendicular to the hydrostatic axis so perpendicular to the hydrostatic axis this so this uh, you know uh, this uh, if you take the projection of this one you will have the this is the pyramid surface which is uh, you know hexagonal pyramid surface and which is also called as the pipe plane which is actually perpendicular to the uh, you know uh, perpendicular to the hydrostatic axis uh, and where uh, more coulomb criterion can be described as irregular hexagon with uh, sides of equal length where more coulomb criterion can be described as irregular hexagon with uh, sides of equal length so here uh, the pyramidal surface in principal stress space and cross section equi pressure plane is actually given here and these uh, the, the equations which uh, uh, you know which are shown here they actually represent the all the six edges which are forming the uh, hexagonal pyramid surface and uh, the failure surface on the equi pressure that is sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 is equal to constant or a five plane perpendicular to the hydrostatic axis where the Mohr Coulomb uh, criterion uh, Mohr Coulomb can be described as a regular hexagon with sides of equal length. So this is uh, the irregular hexagon with uh, is actually shown once again here where uh, this is the uh, hydrostatic uh, axis and here is the point where the sigma 2 dash is there. So isotropy requires a three fold symmetry uh, because uh, an interchange of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 should not influence the failure surface for an isotropic material. So if you have got isotropic uh, material the requires three fold symmetry because of an interchange of say interchange of sigma 1 sigma 2 3 should not influence the uh, failure surface for an isotropic material note that the failure surface need only be given in any angle in any of the uh, one of the 60 degrees regions that is uh, that is one of the 60 degrees regions that is what actually is shown here. So uh, note that the failure surface need only be given in any of one of the 60 degrees regions and more coulomb failure surface is regular hexagon in principal uh, stress space. Uh, now consider the transformation uh, uh, from principal stress space uh, sigma 1 sigma 2 3 to Mohr diagram sig, uh, sigma tau. So although the radial distance from the hydrostatic axis to the stress point is proportional to the deviated stress a point in uh, principal stress space does not directly indicate the value of the shear stress on a plane. Uh, however, each point on the failure surface in principal stress space corresponds to uh, more circle tangent to the fa uh, failure analog. So uh, though the radial distance from the hydrostatic axis to the stress point is proportional to the deviatoric uh, stress, a point in the principal stress space does not directly indicate the value of the shear stress on a plane. However, each point on the failure surface in principal stress corresponds to a more circle tangent to the failure analog. So uh, further uh, you know extending the discussion for the particular uh, case where uh, sigma 2 is in, uh, in the intermediate principal stress in the order sigma 1 dash greater than sigma 2 dash greater than sigma 3 dash 
or sigma 1 dash greater than sigma 1 dash greater than sigma 1 greater than sigma 2 greater than sigma 3. The failure surface is given by the side ACD of the hexagonal pyramid. The failure surface is given by the side ACD of the pyramid that is the side ACD of the pyramid ACD of the pyramid here which is actually shown in the surface ACD D is this point sigma 2 dash. The principal stresses at point D represent the stress state for a triaxial compression test where sigma 1 and sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3 at point D and at point D is given by circle D in the Mohr circle diagram. The point D that is given by the, the Mohr circle D which is actually shown here. So this is the Mohr circle which is actually shown here point D this is the Mohr circle D. Similarly, for point C with principal stresses sigma 3 and uh, sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2 associated with the triaxial extension test, Mohr circle C depicts the stress state where point D and C can be viewed as the extremes of the intermediate stress variation. So, the uh, where points D and C uh, can be seen as the extremes of the intermediate stress variation and the normal uh, and shear stresses correspond to failure are given by points DF and CF. So, so this indicates the you know the CF and DF indicates the extremes of the extremes of the uh, you know the uh, intermediate stress variation intermediate stress variation. So it can be seen that uh, the CF and DF will give the the failure points and uh, so for this is for, for the triaxial test and uh, where more circle C depicts the stress state and points D and C can be viewed as the extremes of the intermediate stress variation and the normal and shear stresses correspond to failure are given by points DF and CF and uh, points lying on the line CD on the pyramidal uh, failure surface will be represented by uh, circles between C and D. So points lying on the line CD points lying on the line CD that is uh, this they are represented by the uh, by the so represented by circles between C and D that is we are actually talking about circles between uh, C and D between circles between C and D. And uh, as can be seen this hexagonal uh, uh, you know pyramidal surface has the corners that may sometime create uh, problems in uh, computations and however this uh, particular difficulty is quite easily overcome by introducing a local rounding of the corners according to Griffith 19, uh, Griffith's 1990. So the Mohr coulomb uh, uh, in uh, uh, space that is principal stress space Mohr coulomb in principal stress space which is hexagonal pyramid surface has corners that may be sometimes uh, uh, create problems in uh, uh, computation. So this particular difficulty is quite easily uh, can overcome by the introducing uh, local rounding of the corners according to Griffith's 1990. So uh, as we have discussed uh, the other way of uh, describing tau is equal to sigma uh, tau sigma plus tan phi in, the, in terms of principal stresses as f is equal to sigma 1, sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash. Uh, minus sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash sin phi dash minus 2 c dash cos phi dash is equal to 0. So this uh, can be obtained further uh, in order to make attempts to derive a consistency conditions of the Mohr coulomb uh, in vacuum space uh, with uh, p dash is equal to uh, you know uh, where, uh, where uh, specific volume is equal to 1 plus e and p dash is equal to 1 by 3 sigma 1 dash plus sigma 2 dash plus sigma 3 dash and q is equal to uh, square root of sigma 1 dash minus sigma 2 dash whole square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 dash whole square plus sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash whole square. So the whole divided by 2 and for triaxial conditions as per we have said the triangle when we have got a triaxial sample and uh, that is a cylindrical sample sigma 2 dash is equal to sigma 3 dash when we have this sigma 2 dash is equal to sigma 3 dash and what we get is that p dash is equal to 1 by 3 sigma 1 dash plus 2 sigma 3 dash and q is equal to sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash. So when we put this into uh, when we put this 
this we get simplified to q is equal to sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash and p is equal to 1 by 3 uh, sigma 1 dash plus 2 sigma 3. Now by substituting uh, uh, these uh, here uh, we can write uh, sigma 1 dash uh, sigma 1 dash is equal to sigma 1 dash is equal to uh, you know 3 p dash minus uh, 2 sigma 3 dash. So sigma 1 dash uh, can be written as sigma 1 dash uh, can be written as uh, 3 p dash minus 2 sigma 3 dash. So if you put uh, uh, p dash uh, is equal to 1 by 3 into uh, sigma 1 dash 1 by 3 into sigma 1 dash plus 2 sigma 3 we will get uh, sigma 1 dash and sigma 3 dash is equal to sigma 1 minus q and if you substitute q is equal to sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash we will get sigma 3. So by using these uh, values uh, with uh, sigma 1 dash is equal to 3 p dash minus 2 sigma 3 dash and sigma 3 dash is equal to sigma 1 dash minus q and substituting in this uh, uh, particular equation and what we get is that as uh, the uh, sigma 1 dash is equal to uh, 3 p dash uh, minus uh, uh, when you substitute for sigma 3 dash here uh, what we get is that sigma 1 dash is equal to 3 p dash minus 2 sigma 1 dash plus 2 q and where with this we can write sigma 1 dash as 3 p dash plus 2 q by 3 where p dash is equal to sigma 1 dash plus 2 sigma 3 dash by 3 and q is equal to sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 uh, sigma, sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash and similarly sigma 3 dash is equal to sigma 1 minus q and by substituting these values we get 3 p dash minus q by 3. So with this what we can write is that uh, you know sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash is equal to when you sub when you add these two when you add these two sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash is equal to 6 p dash plus q by 3. So uh, sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash is equal to 6 p dash plus q by 3 and which is uh, you know when we add to this. Uh, what we get is that when you substitute in uh, this equation, when you substitute in this equation, uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3 that is nothing but uh, uh, q is equal to sin phi plus 6, 6, 6 p dash plus q by 3 plus 2 c cos phi. So by simplifying this, we get uh, 3 q is equal to 6 p dash sin phi plus q sin phi plus 6 c cos, cos phi. So what we get is that uh, 3q uh, when you do the cross multiplication is equal to 6p dash sin pi plus q sin phi plus 6c cos phi. Uh, so the, the equation actually has got uh, pi dash and here also pi dash and here also pi dash and here also pi dash and pi dash. So q is equal to 6 sin phi dash divided by 3 minus sin phi dash into p dash plus 6c cos pi dash uh, divided by 3 minus sin phi dash. So this is actually indicated as q is equal to n uh, the new p dash plus c star new, uh, new p dash plus c star where nu is equal to 6 sin phi by 3 minus sin phi dash and c star is equal to 6 c cos phi by 3 minus sin phi dash where this is actually called as uh, formulation for the Bohr Coulomb uh, model uh, in PQ space. This is actually called as a formulation for the uh, Bohr Coulomb model in PQ space and assuming that uh, the flow rule uh, and ideal plasticity condition and we can write f is equal to f function of p dash q is equal to q uh, minus nu uh, p dash minus c star is equal to 0. So by taking the differentiation with respect to p dash and dou f by dou p dash uh, uh, dp dash plus dou f by uh, dou q into dq is equal to 0. So this is actually con uh, consistency condition what which is called as far as the Mohr Coulomb model in PQ space is concerned. So what uh, we have done is that from uh, you know the uh, you know alternative way of expressing tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi which we have taken and from uh, you know uh, from these cons considerations of by using these invariants p is equal p dash is equal to one third of sigma 1 dash plus sigma 2 dash plus sigma 3 dash by 3 and q is equal to root over sigma 1 minus sigma 1 dash minus sigma 2 dash whole square plus sigma 2 dash minus sigma 3 dash whole square plus sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash whole square by 2 and when for triaxial conditions when you put sigma 2 dash is equal to sigma 3 dash we get p dash is equal to one third of uh, sigma 1 plus uh, 2 sigma 3 dash and q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash. So uh, what we have written is that 
uh, we have written this sigma 1 dash is equal to 3 p dash uh, minus 2 sigma 3 dash. So, this is actually expressed in terms of sigma 1 dash is equal to 3 p dash minus 2 q, 2 q sigma 3 dash and this is actually expressed as uh, q is equal to uh, that is sigma 1 dash minus sigma 3 dash. So, sigma 3 dash is equal to sigma 1 minus q. So, that is what actually we have written. Then what we have done is that sigma 1 dash is equal to 3 p dash minus 2 sigma 1 dash plus 2 q. So, we actually substituted uh, for uh, sigma 3 uh, sigma 3 dash sigma 1 minus q and then expressed in terms of p and q that is uh, sigma 1 dash is equal to uh, 3 p dash plus 2 q by 3 and similarly uh, when we have taken sigma 3 dash is equal to uh, 3 p uh, dash minus 2 sigma 3 dash minus q and with that we have got 3 p dash minus q by 3 and then added sigma 1 dash to sigma 3 dash then we have got sigma 1 plus sigma 3 is equal to 3 p 6, 6 p dash plus q by 3. So, when you add uh, sigma 1 dash plus sigma 3 dash we have got in terms of uh, uh, p dash and q where p dash is equal to sigma 1 dash plus 2 sigma 3 dash by 3 and q is equal to sigma 1 minus sigma 3 dash we get uh, 6 p dash plus q by 3. Now, this uh, particular expression which is uh, you know uh, for q it is sigma 1 uh, for sigma 1 minus sigma 3 uh, uh, this this is actually replaced by uh, q and then sigma 1 plus sigma 3 was actually replaced by 6 p dash plus q by 3 and then simplification yielded a consistency and more column model in the p q space which is q is equal to n uh, that nu p dash plus c star where mu is equal to this particular coefficient that is 6 sin phi dash divided by 3 minus sin phi dash and c star is equal to 6 c cos phi dash by 3 minus sin phi. So, uh, f is equal to uh, you know the formulation for Mohr Coulomb model in PQ space can be expressed as uh, q minus nu p dash minus c star is equal to 0 and assuming the associated flow rule in uh, and uh, ideal flow uh, ideal plasticity uh, which we have uh, started with uh, uh, you know uh, by idealizing the geometrial in case of Mohr Coulomb uh, criterion where a function of uh, uh, p dash q is equal to uh, q minus nu p dash minus c star is equal to 0 which is dou f by dou p dash dp dash plus dou f by dou q uh, dq is equal to 0 which is actually called as the consistency condition. Now, the some limitations of uh, Mohr Coulomb theory uh, this we have discussed but we are uh, again elaborating. So, one of the prime limitations we actually said is that the Mohr envelope is uh, you know uh, uh, is a curve and the Coulomb equation is uh, a straight line. So, uh, within the uh, usual range of the experimental range in the laboratory uh, what, what has been done is that uh, the it is actually assumed as uh, uh, a circular uh, that is for the uh, uh, that is within the usual experimental range in the laboratory. So, possible or estimation of the safety factor for the uh, slope stability calculations can be interpreted and difficulties in calibration because of the linearization. So, we actually have taken linearization. So, there are some difficulties in the uh, you know calibration and uh, then second is that uh, the effect of the intermediate principal stress sigma 2 dash on the condition and failure though we actually discussed that it is uh, uh, you know uh, not influencing the failure, but it is obvious that uh, sigma 2 can have no influence on the conditions at failure for more circle more failure criterion and no matter what magnitude it has. So, though in the Mayer Coulomb criterion uh, it is actually stated as a limitation, but uh, it is obvious that sigma 2 can have no influence on the conditions at failure and no matter what is the magn whatever is the magnitude of the uh, sigma 2 and the intermediate principal stress sigma 2 probably does have an influence on real uh, in real soil, but the Mohr Coulomb failure uh, theory does not consider it. In real soil it may have influence, but uh, the Mohr Coulomb uh, uh, failure theory, theory does not consider it. And uh, Mohr Coulomb failure uh, criterion is well proven for most of the geometrials, but data for clays is still uh, contradictory that is one of the limitation. And the soils on uh, shearing exhibit uh, variable volume change characteristics depending upon the pre consolidation pressure and which cannot be accounted uh, with the Mohr Coulomb theory. 
and in soft soils uh, volumetric plastic strains on shearing are compressive uh, that is negative dilation takes place while while is the uh, you know more coulomb model will predict a continuous dilation so uh, the in soft soils uh, are loose uh, sands the volumetric plastic strains on shearing are compressive in nature that is the, they undergo negative dilation and while the more coulomb model will predict the continuous dilation more coulomb more coulomb more coulomb model predict the continuous dilation so this is also stated as one of the limitations of the more coulomb theory now the uh, you know definition of failure uh, when we further uh, you know uh, connect ourselves to uh, friction and interlocking concept in order to connect that let us look into what is the definition of failure and failure along a plane in a material occurs by critical combination of normal and shear stress that is when we have tau is equal to function of sigma and tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi the shear stress is the function of material cohesion or soil inherent strength and an angle of internal friction and so this internal friction can be due to you know the sliding friction but this sliding which actually can happens between you know two particles or also due to interlocking that is you know when one particle get locked into other particle and then there is uh, r part depends upon the shape of the particle like an you know, angularity and then uh, and the angularity and size of the particles so the failure along a plane in a material occurs by critical combination of normal and shear stress where tau and c tau is equal to c plus sigma tan phi where shear stress is a function of material cohesion c and angle of internal friction phi so if you look into the uh, in the definition of uh, failure when we have got uh, tau sigma uh, envelope and uh, when you have a uh, point a stress point a and this is actually said that uh, it is uh, stable no failure occurs and but uh, when actually the no, no shear failure occurs for a and but when it is an actually on the uh, failure envelope and when when it uh, when it is actually uh, on the failure envelope then it is uh, you know uh, the shear failure occurs and this is the tau is equal to function of sigma is actually represented here and uh, when it is here that means that uh, you know the stress state cannot exist above the failure envelope that means that the failure would have already taken place the failure would have already taken place similarly uh, when we draw the more circle above the failure envelope that uh, implies that uh, the failure would have already taken place so the point c is uh, cannot exist and at point b uh, which is uh, you know at failure and point a is actually is stable the safe against the failure now we can also look into the flow rule for more coulomb for dilatancy angle and for for more more coulomb flow 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 rule is defined through the dilatancy angle of the soil where g of sigma dash is equal to tau minus sigma dash and tan psi dash minus constant is equal to 0 so this is the plastic potential function so this is the uh, you know for the dilatancy angle so g sigma dash is equal to tau minus uh, sigma dash and tan psi dash minus constant is 0 where psi dash is the dilatancy angle and uh, which is actually less than uh, which is less than the angle of internal friction and which uh, which is less than the angle of internal friction now the interlock interlocking concept and its interpretations when we look into it the frictional soil behavior is mainly influenced by the two factors uh, one is uh, you know uh, frictional resistance or sliding resistance between the uh, you know uh, shear part two particles uh, upon shearing and to expand the soil against the confining pressure so uh, then the the soil which actually can get uh, undergo increase in volume upon the uh, shear under confining pressure so and uh, angular uh, friction can be defined as uh, pi is equal to phi u plus uh, beta where angle of sliding friction between the mineral surfaces and beta is the effect of interlocking where that is also a combination which is uh, can be said as because of the uh, angular uh, angularity of the particles and all so where phi is equal to phi u plus uh, beta where phi is the angle of sliding friction between the mineral surfaces and beta is the uh, effect of internal uh, interlocking so uh, the phi varies with the nature of the packing of the soil 
So denser the packing higher is the value of phi the denser the packing that is the in a given uh, uh, volume if there are more number of particles are there then it is called as denser packing higher is the value of pi if phi u for a given soil is constant and b must change with the dense uh, you know denseness of the soil particle. So if phi u for a given soil is constant let us say uh, for a particular uh, angularity particular shape and if it is constant b must change with the denseness of the soil particle. So b increases with increasing denseness of the soil and because more work to be done to overcome the effect of interlocking. So because the particles are get locked in a dense configuration the soil actually has to work uh, a lot uh, in order to undergo this uh, uh, movement and so beta increases with increasing the denseness of the soil uh, due to shear and because more work to be done uh, to overcome the effect of interlocking uh, which actually arises due to shear. So the effect of the angularity of the soil particles if you look into it soil possessing uh, angular soil particles will show high friction angle. Uh, effect of angularity of the soil particles if you look into it soil uh, possessing angular uh, soil particles will show high friction angles than that of rounded soil particles because angular soil particles will show a greater degree of interlocking and higher value of beta. So uh, the so called uh, this beta will be high uh, for uh, you know angular soil particles because of the greater degree of interlocking and higher value of uh, beta. Now uh, further the interlocking concept with interpretations with the dilation. So if you look into that here beta is the function of the uh, you know the dilation of the uh, function of the dilatancy of the soil. So if you take uh, a loose arrangement of the grains if you take a spherical grain and uh, you can see that these are the void spaces. So when they are subjected to a vertical uh, you know uh, in the vertical stress and a, and a shear in the horizontal direction and uh, if this is the case the soil actually undergoes uh, you know a negative dilation in the sense that uh, the soil undergoes uh, a compression and which actually takes place like this. Uh, so uh, this is uh, you know uh, called as a negative dilation so the volume decreases here but here when you have the soil particles which are actually uh, you know um, you know dense then you can see that there is uh, you know the increase in the volume then there is an increase in the volume takes place. So um, you know this uh, interlocking concept and interpretations can be uh, interpreted uh, by taking a CISA uh, concept or analogy wherein uh, when we take uh, this into consideration then we can see that uh, you know the so called uh, the dilatancy angle and other concepts can be discussed. So the interlocking concept and interpretation with the dilation for loose sand the volume decreases with the shearing for loose sand the volume decreases with the shearing that is called what we calling a negative dilation and for dense sand the volume initially uh, you know very very marginally decreases and then in thereafter it shows actually an increase in the uh, you know the uh, dilation. So this is this is increase in the volume increase in the volume upon shearing. So and this shows that uh, this shows uh, in this actually the tendency of this uh, dilatancy uh, decreases with increase in the uh, co confining pressure with increase in the confining pressure. So let us consider the interlocking concept and interpretations where dilation and direct shear response as we said that uh, the one of the tests uh, if you do uh, uh, by using uh, uh, for determining the shear strength of the soil is the direct shear that means that uh, you will be sub placing a uh, soil mass in a box and then two boxes and when we allow the box to undergo movement then you can see that uh, you know the shear is actually applied along the a predetermined uh, failure plane which is horizontal. So uh, here uh, this is for the dense sand a typical variation for dense sand where q by p q by p versus x that deflection. So q is the shear force and p is the normal force and uh, so uh, this is for dense sand and this is for the loose sand. So loose sand actually has uh, undergone uh, uh, you know uh, you know there is uh, uh, a compression and then uh, a dense sand. So here uh, where it can be seen that uh, 
where it can be seen uh, that uh, the shear which actually undergoes a movement uh, uh, with this with this we can actually calculate uh, what is the you know uh, the friction angle with reference to uh, you know application of this uh, the so called uh, uh, the dilation. So, here the total work done is equal to uh, d w uh, which is nothing but p into delta y that is in the vertical direction p into delta y in the vertical direction and uh, uh, q delta x that is in the horizontal direction. So, delta x is the horizontal movement in the x direction and uh, delta y is the vertical movement in the uh, vertical direction. So, work done is net work done is equal to p into delta y and q into delta x. So, we can write p delta y plus q delta x is equal to is counted by uh, mu p delta x that is the friction which actually mobilized along this one. So, by dividing delta y by delta x is equal to uh, mu minus q by p when you simplify this what we get is that delta y by delta x is equal to mu uh, q by p and which is nothing but uh, which is nothing but tan psi and uh, where tan psi is equal to uh, tan phi m is minus tan phi c where phi c is equal to tan inverse mu. So, uh, this alternatively we can say that phi m is equal to phi c plus psi. So, what we have done is that uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the with reference to interlocking concept and interpretation the total work done is equal to d w is equal to p delta y plus q delta x and then we divided uh, right through uh, by delta x and uh, with that we have got uh, delta y by delta x plus q is equal to mu p and then when you simplify further and what we have got is that uh, delta y by delta x is equal to mu that is due to sliding friction by minus q by p and uh, is equal to tan inverse psi tan inverse psi is nothing but uh, the so called inclination of this one that is called the delta y by delta x and which is uh, which is nothing but uh, you know uh, tan psi uh, is equal to tan psi is equal to uh, tan phi m that is the due to uh, friction minus tan phi c that is because of the interlocking uh, and so with that phi c is equal to tan inverse mu phi c is equal to tan inverse mu and which uh, we, we, we have written here and alternately we can write uh, phi m phi m is equal to uh, phi c plus psi. So, phi m is equal to phi c psi that is what actually we have uh, said. Uh, uh, from the deliberation discussed just now. So, how to you know understand this so called dilatancy. So, why do we get volume changes when I apply the shear stresses and this can be explained with a, a simple analogy uh, which is a saw blade analogy you can see that uh, the orientation of the uh, these uh, planes they are upward and this is the shear direction and this is the normal stress. And similarly what will happen is that when the particles are under a dense configuration when it is subjected to shear the particles will raid on raid on another particle and be subjected to a similar analogical movement. So, uh, the analogy was actually we have been brought between the interlocking saw blades and dense packing of the grains. So, the simple analogy we can actually relate correlate is that interlocking saw blades uh, with the dense packing of the grains when they are actually subjected to shear. Uh, you know the inclination of that uh, interlocking plane blades is the dilation angle and uh, this angle and that angle is actually represented here this is psi and this is psi. So, it is uh, phi is equal to psi plus uh, uh, phi m that is the uh, due to friction the apparent externally mobilized angle of friction on horizontal planes phi is larger than the angle of friction resistant resisting the sliding on the inclined planes. So, the strength is equal to friction plus dilatancy. So, it is actually nothing but the actual strength of the soil is nothing but the friction plus uh, dilatancy the friction plus. So, uh, the when the it is the angle of internal friction is not only that you know it actually has got only friction, but also as, as also the component of the dilatancy. Now, this further uh, you know can be uh, the C uh, saw blade analogy can be extended to initially dense and the critical and initially loose conditions. So, you can uh, see that in case of uh, you know in case of uh, initially dense the particles actually have no way uh, to um, uh, move except 
they have to raid on one another. Uh, so the raiding of the particles takes place uh, on uh, the one particle raid on another particle and this particle raid on another particle. So the orientation of the C, sub, C sub blade can be seen on the upward direction. In case of critical condition where you know you can see that is horizontal but in case of say initially loose soil you can see that this is uh, you know horizontal uh, this is inclined down that means that it actually undergoes the compression. So, uh, when the soil is initially denser than the critical state, soil is initially denser than the critical state, it must achieve then as particles slide past each other uh, owing to the imposed shear strain they will an uh, uh, strain they will an average, sub, average separate. So, when a soil is initially denser than the critical state, it must achieve uh, uh, you know a denser uh, configuration then as the particles slide each other owing to the imposed shear strain then they, they actually have got a tendency to separate. The particle movements will spread about an angle and that is actually called as dilation. So, so see the orientation of the sub blade here. So, this is analogy and this is actually what happens in the soil in the real soil. And uh, when you have uh, you know uh, the orientation which is actually uh, you know the initially loose soil when the soil is initially looser than the final critical state then the particles will tend to get closer to, uh, together as the soil is disturbed and the average angle of dilation will be negative indicating a contraction. So that is why the saw blade uh, you know inclination or plane of inclination is actually shown below. So this is uh, initially loose soil uh, tend to become uh, you know denser here. And when we have uh, you know uh, uh, have a place where it is uh, constant you know in the sense that uh, critical state in the if the density of the soil does not uh, so in the critical state is the way no volume change occurs. So if the density of the soil does not have to change in order to reach a critical state then there is a zero dilatancy as the soil shear at constant volume. So the soil shear takes place at a constant volume. So it is important to realize that the critical state is only reached when uh, the particles uh, they have uh, the full opportunity to juggle around the and then come into the new configuration. So, if the confining stress is increased where the particles are being moved around then they will tend to uh, finish up in a more compact state. So, uh, we have seen for uh, initially dense state and initially loose state and uh, also in a, in, a, in a critical state and in the critical state what we are saying is that if the density of the soil does not have to change in order to reach a critical state then there is a zero dilatancy as the soil shear at constant volume and it is important to realize that a critical state is only reached when the particles have had full opportunity to juggle around and come into new configurations. So if the, if the confining stress is increased when the particles are being moved around then they will tend to finish up in a more uh, compacted state. Uh, so in this uh, particular lecture we try to understand about the Mohr coulomb in the pyramidal uh, hexagonal uh, uh, surface. And uh, also we discussed the consistency condition as far as the Mohr coulomb uh, condition is concerned and thereafter we actually introduced ourselves to interlocking concept and then we also said that uh, and introduced to that when the soils uh, particularly in the dense soil or in a war consolid soil and when it is uh, when, when it undergoes uh, shearing and we said that uh, it is going to experience uh, a phenomenon and which is called dilation and that angle is called dilation angle and uh, that is actually is uh, the phenomenon is called dilatancy and the, you know, the angle which is uh, called the psi the dilatancy angle and this dilatancy angle uh, you know uh, 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 decreases the, sub, uh, the suppressment of the dilatancy or dilation phenomenon can be observed uh, once uh, there is an increase in the normal stress. So we will further uh, discuss in the forthcoming lecture. Uh, uh, after having introduced about the uh, you know the different uh, methods for the determining the shear strength and further we will connect with these stress paths.